Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Hutchins. I work for Renovus. I'm in the CTO's office, and I'm also the Optical and Networking Forum's uh, Physical and Clear Working Group Vice Chair of Energy Efficient Interfaces. And today's talk is going to talk about uh, what the work we're doing there on energy efficient photonic interconnects for scale up, and especially about the requirements that we see. So one of the things we did is we uh, surveyed a lot of end users, hyperscalers, about what they needed and have uh, put together a set of requirements, and those requirements can be kind of confusing. So we thought what we'd do is uh, take some time to go through those and uh, try to explain the rationale behind them. So something funny happened with the slides here. <laughs> something didn't translate over. Let's see if the next slide. Well, <laughs> I, that's pretty blank, isn't it? Well, what I wanted to, if I go back here, unfortunately you can't see the, uh, see the picture here. I don't know what happened to it, but uh, basically it was a picture of a, uh, what a pod looks like. And a pod, uh, AI uh, compute pod, has um, two, uh, has a, ha is consists of a number of nodes, and each node can have a, uh, uh, a GP, uh, one or more CPUs and one or more accelerators in it, and then a bunch of memory. And then there are five different kinds of links that are using the AI pod. And I really appreciate <laughs> So sorry that the diagram didn't show here. But uh, one of the first ones is the compute I.O., which is the, 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 the communication like that goes to the NIC and some of the other components in the system. And that's usually a PCIe, uh, like with CXL, or a dotted interface like UCIe for the protocol. There's also memory interfaces, which would be like uh, CXL, or PSE, or even a high bandwidth memory interfaces. The third interface is scale up, and for scale up, that would be either UA link, uh, ultra ethernet, NV link, scale up ethernet, and et cetera. And then there's a scale out network, which would be UEC, InfiniBand, ethernet, and so on. And what the scale out network did is it interconnects all of these pods that have multiple accelerators in them. So basically, there are these five types of links. I hope more pictures showed up okay. So, um, so this is a, so what I wanted to do here is talk about what are the kind of reaches that are required in one of these AI uh, 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 systems. And so typically today these rack, they're single rack connected with a lot of accelerators in it. And these orange lines that you see are the uh, interfaces that run up and down the, uh, the, between the accelerators and the switches. And if you want to expand it, you have to move out to multiple racks. And so you use these orange lines to interconnect uh, the various racks together as well. So that represents a scale up domain. And then for the scale out, that's the green at the bottom that connects all these different uh, dual rack pods together. So typically the um, scale up is uh, on the order of 20 meters. That's the requirements we got. And uh, typically today they're copper for the short reach inside the rack, but need to go to transition to optics. And in the bottom, for the scale out network, those typically are on the order of 100 meters, and that's optics today. So the next the next one has to do with uh, latency, um, and what's missing. I don't know how these slides all got messed up, but there's a table at the top that talked about the requirements for latency, um, and uh, there. So I, I'm going to what I'm do here is describe where the latency requirement comes from, and so one of the first things to um, show, and this didn't show either, was the uh, that th this basically in this area you're doing a lot of multiplication in these pods. There's lots and lots of parameters, so these uh, uh, parameter sets are broken up into tiles, and each and the accelerators each get a t two sets of tiles to multiply together and get the results, and the results get summed up. Into a, into a final tile in the result. Now, if you think about matrix multiplication, it isn't just any two tiles multiplied that gives you the answer. You have to sum all the row and column multiplications together. So it's a little bit of synchronicity that's involved when you do this calculation. So that's why, that's why in, in a high level, that's why latency is important. All these things need to cooperate and be working more or less together. So in this diagram at the bottom, I'm getting an example, a very simple example of, uh, of um, what happens in this kind of communication for scale up. And I'm gonna be leveraging uh, credit-based flow control or CBFC in this. 
Um, there's a number of protocols, as you just saw in the last presentation, that also use the same uh, mechanism. So the sender is going to send a block to the receiver. The receiver receives the block. It's going to do the um, uh, you know, uh, error detection on it. If there's any errors, those errors will be corrected. If they can be corrected, then there's an OK sent back to the sender. And so that takes care of the first one. And the second uh, time point, then you s the transmitter can send block two. The receiver, in this case, gets a block. Let's assume that there's some uncorrectable errors. It sends back an basically an error signal back to the transmitter. The transmitter still has that block two in its buffer, <coughs> transmit buffer. So uh, at time point three, it can now send that over. Um, and that's received and then say it's correct. So what, what we've seen here is in three time periods, we've transmitted two blocks because there was a retry that had to be done for the middle block. So essentially we got two out of three or 66% of the maximum bandwidth of that link available to us. Now in a real life situation, there's many more buffers and so the links are always busy and so you don't have this level of impact. But this gives you an idea of where the latency requirement comes from. It's really about the round trip when there, is a, when there has to be a retry. So it's really important here is to minimize the tail latency uh, and have low bit error rates to get the effective link bandwidth. Another key requirement is reliability. <clears throat> there are two types, types of reliability. One is uh, what we call link reliability. This has to do with, um, as you've seen in the previous slide, the bit error rate. And so we want to keep that low. Uh, the other side of this is the hard reliability. And this is where, um, you know, if there's a failure, uh, then you have to stop the, the work that's going on in that pod, replace the components, and restart it from the last save point. <clears throat> so that's very time consuming, as mentioned in earlier presentations today. Another key important uh, aspect is that transceivers that are located behind the front panel are going to need higher reliability than those at the front panel because it's going to take a lot longer and a lot more effort to replace something behind the front panel if you have to pull out the, out the uh, board. So we, we are going to need to use optics to build these larger pods. And you know, copper, these passive copper links are very reliable today. Uh, and so optical transceivers to come into this space have to have that kind of reliability. The next number you've seen a lot of people talk about is the uh, ASIC uh, escape bandwidth edge density. And so I wanted to give a little understanding of where those requirements come from. So typically what we see from the, the requirements is 2T per millimeter bandwidth edge density. That's calculated as TX plus RX over the edge width. And on the bottom, on the, on the, on the right side, you see a picture there. It's a packaging substrate. You can see there's some HBM memory. There's an XPU on there. And there's three optical engines th at the bottom. And uh, if, you, if you look at it, let's see that. Yeah, that's good. So if you look at it where I highlighted there, you can see there are copper traces between the XPU and the optical engines are very straight and short. It means you have a very low loss link. And on the right, what we show is an example with co-packaged copper. So the substrate's slightly larger to make room for the co-packaged copper connectors. And uh, if, we, if we take a look at the uh, links here, um, boy, that didn't draw right either. And it's supposed to show that these copper lines are fanning out to those copper connectors because they're wider than the actual you know, edge of the CPU chip. And then the, uh, from the co-packaged copper connectors down to the OSAP module in the front, there's some further fan out. And the edge density requirement really comes from the fact that if you can keep these line lengths short and consistent, you can use lower power interfaces. You can save quite a bit of energy. Which brings us to the next slide here, which talks about energy utilization. And so using the two, two same examples, on the, on the left you can see with the co-package thing, uh, you can you have these very short channels, which allows you to get by with, say, a linear or non-retimed interface. And so that could be in the four to six picojoules per bit kind of a region. On the right side, where you have the copper cables, uh, you could use maybe a non-linear, um, a non-retimed or a linear type interface, but you might want more uh, robustness in those links. And so you might err on the side of using a half retimed or TX retimed RTLR type interface or maybe a fully retimed interface. And uh, you know the trade-off is, is uh, certainly an increase in power. So then we uh, come to um, a graph that kind of puts these things together. 
So on the y-axis, we have the energy utilization uh, in picojoules per bit. On the x-axis, we have the bandwidth edge density uh, in terabits per millimeter. And we'll just take a look at where technologies are today. So if you look at the OCPs, this is where the first column is. There's four uh, things plotted on this chart. The top in the orange would be a fully retimed device. The red would be a, a, a TX retimed. The black would be the non-retimed or linear device. And the, blue, or the green at the bottom would be a passive device. If we move on to see where uh, you know, uh, near package copper connectors are today, they would show up in this range. If we look at uh, you know co-package uh, co copper connectors again passive, they'd be about here. What the hyperscalers really are asking uh, for solutions are in that green box, which represents uh, that target region represents less than four picojoules per bit and greater than two terabits per millimeter. So that's kind of really where they want to be, and uh, you know then this would be where the CPO I drew on the previous slides would be located in that range. That kind of gives you an idea where things are. So I think in summary, the, the next generation of AI compute is going to need these larger pods. And in order to do these larger pods, it's probably not going to be copper for the longer links. It's going to, you're going to have to leverage optical connectivity. And as you've seen from these slides, there's a lot of trade-offs. You know, if you think about them, there's reliability, you know, there's the energy efficiency, and, and, and there's all these different trade-offs. When you architect one of these things, you, for your system, you have to right size. You have to decide what are the right technologies I want to build and uh, use the pod. And the kinds of trade offs that we've been looking at here are co packaging versus, say, co packaged copper, minimizing the latency, uh, you know, minimizing the power consumption, and then uh, making sure that you have good both link and hardware reliability. So then, uh, what can OCP do? So I think there's a lot of organizations that we heard today uh, that are working on in this area, and I think that uh, it might be interesting to see if we could find some uh, way to cooperate between these various organizations uh, to, to help drive the standards together. One of the things that I think that's interesting about the scale space is moving very quickly. If you think about where we were last year at this time, uh, you know, some of these um, things like scale up Ethernet and ultra Ethernet weren't even on the roadmap. There was like a vision of ultra Ethernet going to publish a standard. But in a year, just look at see how, much, how fast things have changed. Uh, so we need to move faster than standards normally do. Um, and so maybe some increased collaboration would be helpful. So I, again, I apologize. I don't know what went wrong with the slides. Uh, but I'm, I believe the full slides will be available. So you'll be able to see the rest of the images <laughs> that weren't there in the slide set. And with that, I'm open for questions. Any questions from audience? Um. So I actually have uh, one one question about that is um, looks like the you know even the CPO is still at right on the edge of the um, two you know the the two terabits uh, uh, edge on that yeah minimal on that so what would be what what would it take to even push that because you know that's ultimately they want many, many more uh, to, to do that. You know, is there a, a vision to think about that or is there uh, something that we can all brainstorm together? Yeah, so, so, so first of all, the answer, the answer is complicated, uh, as you can expect. Uh, I drew that in there just because that was the minimum level. That wasn't, I didn't want to represent anyone, any particular company's technology, but there are people that are at two and, and above in terabits per millimeter and some that are below that. So that's where that point came from. One of the interesting things that, that's important uh, in moving that direction is you, you, it doesn't do you any good if you exceed the 30s edge escape bandwidth. So going a lot more than that, uh, depending on what you use. If you use like a standard UCIE interface, you can certainly get the edge density. The next thing that comes up is what are you going to do for the optical interface? So if you're going to use something like DR, that that you know the number of fibers of that may limit your edge escape density on the optical device. You know, so it so, so there's a lot of I'll, you know I, there's not one simple answer. There's a lot of depends exactly how you do the optical engine and what you do for the optical interface and what you're using for the electrical interface from the from the ASIC.
hi, maybe it's there in one of your slides and it got wiped out. It'd be good if uh, the formal version of the slide has the details about that, the DR, yeah, FR, and the service line rates. That'd sure. be helpful. Sure, thank you. Yeah, could, uh, could you step to? Could you step to uh, the microphone? Um, that would be great because I think they're recording the Here. questions. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for the presentation. Very clear uh, schematics and uh, methodologies for doing the. Uh, connectivity. Um, I wonder uh, what aspects uh, do you think are the most important to standardize at this moment since there are uh, many providers for connectors for instance solutions already existing and being implemented uh, which are commercial mm -hmm. so um, are you looking for the next generations uh, on, on the standardization? Yeah, so so what we're what we're doing is uh, you know by studying it and understanding the requirements, we understand kind of what things are needed. Uh, in standards, one of the worst things you can do is standardize on something too early, because you you might choose the wrong path. So we look for for areas in that ecosystem that you can standardize on. So for instance, one of the things the, the OIF got started on was the external laser source. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was a, a bit decoupled, and, and you know, there's a lot of vendors out now making external laser sources. And uh, we're looking at things we could do on connectors, maybe optical modulation formats, you know, things like that. Steps we can take um, that uh, still give room for innovation and for people to find the, the best solutions for the, for the product. Definitely is a complex topic, <laughs> which yeah. involves many people. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you.